Okay. okay yes. So we have the, the uh, which day today is third day of the meeting. Uh, fourth fourth day of the meeting today. Okay, and we have uh, the the main topic of today is uh, active galactic nuclei. But I think will be also some additional topics. Uh, I am the chairperson of today's session. My name is Gregory Rishagin. And uh, we start. Our first invited speaker is Kwantai Pashkaev from Kazakhstan. Kwantai was also our student at Econet. And it's my pleasure to invite him to give the first lecture. Kwantai, you can start. Okay, thank you very much, Gregory. It's also a pleasure for me to present our recent work uh, in this summer school. And I would like to thank uh, organizers of this summer school, especially Professor Rufini and the IGRANET uh, staff. So today I will speak about accretion disk luminosity for black holes uh, surrounded by dark matter with tangential pressure. And uh, this work is uh, done in collaboration with my uh, PhD students and my colleagues from Italy and Kazakhstan. So Professor Malafarina is originally from Italy, but he works in Kazakhstan at Nazarbayev University. So uh, this is the outline of my uh, presentation. Uh, first, I will speak about motivation, why we have uh, decided uh, to study uh, the influence of accretion, the influence of, and then I will also show you uh, used in this uh, work. And Excuse me, Quanta, you, you were lost moment. for a second. Can you repeat, please, uh, starting from motivation, there was some connection break, okay? Ah, okay. okay. So first I will speak about uh, why we have chosen this topic and um, uh, what is so important in this topic. Uh, so we, I will just uh, specify that uh, we are interested in the influence of dark matter on the luminosity of the accretion disk. And um, uh, in this particular work, we choose the tangential pressure because uh, usually in the literature, people work with isotropic pressure. And of course, I will show you a comparison between isotropic case and uh, tangential case, and uh, also with the carrier metric. So then I will speak about the model and methodology that we used in this work and uh, show you also energy momentum tensor, how we choose the tangential pressure. And after that, I will give also the definition of the flux, uh, radiative flux coming from the accretion disk and also spectral luminosity. And since this work is pure theoretical, um, I will show you uh, the main theoretical setups, what are the model free parameters, and uh, present uh, the main results. And in the end, of course, I will summarize my conclusion and speak about uh, future prospects, uh, how we can extend uh, this work. So the main objective of this talk is uh, to study the influence of dark matter on the accretion disk luminosity. Um, we know that in any galaxy, especially in the central part of the galaxy, we have a supermassive black hole. And in addition, uh, we know that uh, there is distribution of dark matter starting from the halo to the central part of the galaxy. So uh, these are already uh, observed, uh, let's say, objects, dark matter and uh, supermassive black holes. At least for supermassive black holes, we have two pictures from Event Horizon Telescope. And for dark matter, we have some indirect uh, observational evidences like uh, rotation curves of galaxies and uh, gravitational lensing. 
But in addition, uh, there are a lot of theoretical works, um, uh, including the influence of dark matter uh, in the evolution of stars. And sometimes people also involve dark matter in cosmology to explain CMB and other related topics. So the theory of uh, black hole accretion uh, was developed um, in 70s by Novikov, Thorn, uh, and Page. And since then, it was uh, successfully applied to astrophysical black hole candidates to explain the um, features uh, of the observed spectrum. And uh, usually, these observations are almost uh, interpreted, uh, always interpreted under the assumption that black hole is is a um, uh, Schwarzschild black hole or Kerr black hole in vacuum. So only recently there were some attempts uh, to use um, uh, to explain theoretical properties of accretion disk in a geometry different from uh, Kerr black hole or Kerr line element. So concerning dark matter, um, we know that uh, it has distribution. Uh, close to the center, its density uh, is almost constant. If we use uh, the well-known dark matter profiles like Navarro Frank, uh, Burkett profile, and uh, isothermal, and so on, so forth. Only in the case of um, uh, CASP profiles like Navarro Frank and Moore profiles, uh, at the center we have divergence uh, of the density, so it, it tends to infinity. But in general, if we use Burkitt profile and the isothermal profile, uh, also a Nasto profile, the distribution of dark matter close to the galaxy is constant, is almost constant. So in this work, uh, we have the following model. Uh, so we consider supermassive black hole. It is a um, central sphere in this picture. This is three-dimensional picture, and this is uh, two-dimensional cross-section. And we assume that dark matter distribution starts uh, from the region uh, smaller than uh, innermost circular stable orbit for massive particles. That is our assumption because we were interested if um, the distribution of dark matter somehow uh, in the end will affect uh, the east core radius. So uh, the black hole is Schwarzschild, is static, and the distribution of dark matter is also static. And here we have also green, um, uh, okay, green part. It is a accretion disk, uh, which actually starts from east core radius. And uh, this is just schematic illustration uh, because uh, in this case the accretion in this gradius could be as large as up to Rochelle lobe, and also the dark matter distribution can be as large as uh, we observe. Uh, for example, it could extend up to the hello region. But here we just uh, want to introduce our model and have this picture. So this dashed uh, circle is the exactly the region where we have uh, dark matter distribution, and it extends. And then this circle curve is uh, exactly the inner edge of the accretion disk, and it can extend up to certain values. So we want to investigate how this dark matter distribution will affect the luminosity of the accretion disk. And of course, uh, uh, we wanted to see if the presence of dark matter will somehow change the value of the um, ISCO radius, because ISCO we know for static black hole is uh, 6M, 6 black hole mass. And if black hole uh, rotates, then the value of ISCO uh, can be different. For example, if we have uh, core rotating orbits, I mean core rotating particles, in that case, the ISCO radius is smaller than 6 black hole mass. But if we have counter rotating, then ISCO will be larger than six black hole mass. But of course, uh, here we don't consider rotation. Um, I will explain to you later why we don't consider rotation. 
just for simplicity here, we have static black hole and static dark matter distribution. So if we plot um, the mass profile uh, up to the inner edge of the dark matter distribution, we will have black hole mass. And then starting from RB to some, uh, let's say, distance, we will have dark matter distribution. And the mass will be defined through the um, total mass of the system, black hole plus dark matter. So uh, this is now mathematical representation of the um, uh, dark matter mass profile, including black hole here. Uh, RG is the event horizon radius, okay, gravitational radius actually. And uh, RS is the um, uh, surface of dark matter distribution, uh, which is also pre-parameter of the model. So actually here, the black hole mass is a free parameter of the model. RB is also free parameter. RS is also free parameter of the model. And in addition, uh, depending on the density profile for dark matter, uh, we can have also uh, these quantities, which is uh, central density for dark matter distribution, and this is scale radius. These quantities are also free parameters of the model. Unfortunately, for supermassive black holes, uh, I mean, for dark matter around supermassive black holes, uh, we don't have data. Uh, so that's why we can uh, choose arbitrary values for them and investigate uh, the system. Uh, then, uh, in order to calculate the orbital uh, quantities of test particle in the accretion disk, we use the well-known uh, Schwarzschild line element. And the um, energy momentum tensor uh, has been adopted um, using uh, the work of fluorides uh, coming from 70s. So according to fluorides, the zero component of the energy momentum tensor is simply the energy density. The R component uh, is assumed to be zero. Only uh, theta and phi components are different from zero, and uh, they have been uh, adopted uh, to be uh, the function of uh, density and mass profiles. So actually, uh, if you want, I can also give you some details how it was derived. It is very simple. And um, the, this part is called tangential pressure because it is always um, perpendicular uh, to the radial part. And the radial part is assumed to be zero. And due to this fact, we have now uh, two equations. Uh, actually, the first one uh, is related to the mass function. Uh, the second one is related to the potential because n is also a metric function, but at the same time, uh, it is the potential around the uh, system black hole plus dark matter. So in the end, we should solve uh, this uh, equation only for n, because if you remember for isotropic case, when we have um, all the components of the energy momentum tensor and when all of them are equal, um, to each other. Then here we have extra equation that is called Thoman Oppenheimer Walk equation. But in this case, due to the absence of radial component uh, and only the presence of a tangential component, we will not have Thoman Oppenheimer Walk equation. So, in order to solve uh, these equations, we should impose boundary conditions for the metric functions. If in the case of lambda uh, mass function, everything is clear because um, this function is uh, defined through the mass profile and mass profile is continuous. Um, however, in the case of n function, uh, we should impose a boundary condition in order to make sure that everywhere this function is uh, continuous. 
So to make sure that the matching is correct, uh, we should impose boundary conditions. Outside uh, the, the configuration, we will have simple uh, Schwarzschild case with the total mass black hole and uh, dark matter. In between, when we have dark matter distribution, we should solve uh, the previous equation, this equation numerically, and uh, we should match um, with the interior uh, vacuum case when we have Schwarzschild uh, black hole. And this constant is just, um, uh, is the constant makes sure that uh, the matching is uh, smooth, is continuous. So um, after solving the equation for the n function, uh, we can uh, write down the metric itself. And if we know the metric in general relativity, we know we can calculate all the rest um, uh, quantities that we are interested in. For example, uh, using the work of Page and Thorn, we can calculate the flux of the accretion disk. And the flux is given by this formula where m dot is the accretion uh, rate. And usually the accretion rate uh, depends on the system, uh, what kind of system uh, we consider. It could be neutron star and main sequence star, or it could be black hole or just um, white wolf and so on and so forth. So in order not to uh, specify so much uh, this quantity, we just normalized uh, the flux with respect to M. And then um, omega is the orbital angular momentum of test particles. E, capital E, is the energy of test particles. L is the orbital angular momentum of test particles. So as you can see, the flux is defined through these uh, quantities and um, the integral is taken from E square radius to some um, distance, to some distance. So it could be any distance that we are interested in. And of course, um, this expression was um, widely used in the literature, mainly by the group of Yoshi, Narayan, and also Malafarina. So then uh, we uh, wanted to calculate the um, differential luminosity of the accretion disk as a function of radial coordinate. So it is given by this expression. And the last quantity that we were interested in was the spectral luminosity, which can be observed um, uh, from the X-ray emission uh, around the black holes. So here the spectral luminosity is given by the frequency and the temperature uh, of the accretion disk. We assume that um, the accretion disk uh, gives us a black body emission. So actually, if you just look at this formula carefully, it is just a Planck formula for black body emission. But here it is generalized, uh, taking into account the curvature of space time. So spectral luminosity is also the, the function of ISCO radius. So that's why we were interested uh, if dark matter somehow also influences the ISCO radius because it defines the flux, uh, spectral luminosity, and differential luminosity of the accretion disk. So since we have uh, some free parameters uh, in order to study the system, we should impose them uh, a priori. For example, in the case of black hole mass, we have chosen as an example, uh, 5 million solar mass. So it is actually average of uh, supermassive black hole mass. So, and the in <coughs> geometric units, it is around five astronomical unit. Then RB, we have chosen to be smaller than six black hole mass. So it is 5.5 uh, black hole mass. Uh, R0, we have chosen 10 astronomical units. So it is like um, um, the core of the galaxy, the size of the core of the galaxy. 
and then where we have a dark matter distribution i mean so it is also three parameters so uh, anyway we can choose any value for this and then we have chosen uh, raw knot it is a central density for dark matter distribution having these values from 0 .0 0 0.75 times 10 to minus 5 up to 3 and in astronomical units so in geometrical units so we uh, first of all uh, wanted to consider three different cases uh, first of all um, when all dark matter distribution is inside six black hole mass then what happens to the uh, east core radius it turned out that east core radius will be larger than six black hole mass uh, because here um, uh, the east core will be defined as six black hole mass plus six the total mass of dark matter distribution in this case and that case was not interesting for us because we were interested in the case when East core radius will be smaller than six black hole mass. And then we uh, placed the whole dark matter outside uh, six black hole and calculated the East core radius. And the East core radius turned out to be six black hole mass exactly. But this case is not also interesting for us. And in the third case, we placed a dark matter distribution, a part of dark matter distribution inside black hole mass and another part uh, outside six black hole mass. And it turned out that East core radius in this case uh, will be smaller than six black hole mass. And this is exactly what we were look, looking for because uh, the smaller East core, the larger the luminosity and the flux of the accretion disk. So eventually, by fulfilling boundary conditions and um, adopting our um, theoretical setups, we obtained uh, the following results. So the main result that we obtained um, is this one for tangential pressure of dark matter. And as you can see, uh, this is just angular velocity of test particles as a function of radial co coordinate uh, away from the black hole. And as you can see, for pure black hole case, for Schwarzschild case, uh, we have this solid curve and it is always above these dashed curves, which show the angular velocity in the presence of dark matter with different, um, with different densities. Here, these densities are um, uh, normalized uh, according to this expression. So for the sake of comparison, we also, in our previous work, uh, calculated angular velocity of test particles in the Kerr metric in vacuum for different um, values of the spin parameter. And as you can see, we have similar behavior. Uh, that for static case, the angular velocity is always uh, larger with respect to the uh, rotating case. And here we also calculated a similar uh, system, I mean, considered similar system, but with isotropic pressure. And uh, the only difference here is that uh, here isotropic pressure, here only tangential pressure, and uh, the boundary conditions we use slightly different because initially um, we just wanted to make sure that uh, the metric functions uh, are continuous. So in both cases, the results seem uh, similar, but uh, we have different boundary conditions and uh, different configurations. Then we also calculated the energy of uh, test particles in the accretion disk. So as you can see, uh, for the Kerr metric in vacuum, the Schwarzschild um, case is always larger than uh, for rotating case. And in the case of tangential pressure, we see that uh, for smaller distances, the energy of particles um, in the case of Schwarzschild metric is larger, 
but but at large distances we have the opposite picture that's why here we have um epilog i mean zoom of this part of the curve and here we use different um boundary conditions and as you can see um due to the um, uh, boundary condition we can have different behavior uh, we also calculated the same uh, quantities using uh, similar boundary conditions at uh, like we did in tangential pressure case and um, if the boundary conditions are the same the behavior for isotropic case uh, will be the same uh, almost identical so here we have uh, angular momentum for the care metric again the Schwarzschild case is always larger uh, for the uh, tangential pressure case with dark matter we have uh, at smaller distances um, for Schwarzschild case larger values of angular momentum but at large distances smaller with respect to the dark matter uh, so here again, uh, as I told you earlier, we use different boundary conditions, even if this is isotropic case. But if uh, we use uh, the boundary condition showed, I mean shown in this work, the behavior for isotropic case will be identical as in the tangential pressure cases. So uh, the flux, the radiative flux. Um, has the same behavior both in care metric case in vacuum and uh, static case uh, Schwarzschild black hole surrounded by dark matter. Uh, so we can say that somehow the presence of dark matter mimics the rotation of a black hole. So from observations, of course, if we can measure this, we cannot distinguish if um, we have um, flux coming from care metric or uh, coming from the uh, static Schwarzschild uh, black hole surrounded by dark matter. So here, uh, due to the different uh, boundary conditions, so we have different behavior, but even if it is isotropic case, we use um, similar boundary conditions like in this case, the picture will be identical. So for isotropic case and for tangential case, the pictures will be identical with the same boundary conditions. Uh, here we also calculated uh, this um, differential luminosity and we have similar behavior. So for Schwarzschild case, it is always smaller with respect to the presence of dark matter and for the case of care metric, uh, we see that um, differential luminosity is always larger when we have uh, rotating black holes and co-rotating uh, orbits. Here, the situation is the same. So if we use the same boundary conditions, the pictures will be identical. And the last quantity that is essential and could be observed is the um, spectral luminosity coming from the accretion disk and as you can see, in the case of care black hole in vacuum, the Schwarzschild uh, case is always smaller with respect to the uh, care case with different um, spin parameter. And um, here, of course, uh, this is spectral luminosity and we have here the frequency of the emission. So it is quite high, so it is in logarithmic scale. So actually it corresponds to the X-ray uh, uh, range, X-ray range. And in the case of dark matter, I mean, black hole surrounded by dark matter with tangential pressure, with um, isotropic pressure, we see that at smaller frequencies, uh, the luminosity, uh, is smaller with respect to the Schwarzschild case. But at larger frequencies, which correspond to the um, uh, re region close to black hole, uh, the spectral luminosity is larger with respect to static black hole case. And as you can see, this um, 
quantity spectral luminosity can be used in order to distinguish two systems, Kerr black hole in vacuum or Schwarzschild black hole surrounded by uh, dark matter distribution. So of course, at uh, larger frequencies, we cannot distinguish these uh, two uh, systems, but at lower frequencies due to this difference, we can distinguish whether we have a black hole that is static and surrounded by dark matter or that is um, rotating black hole in uh, vacuum. Uh, we used here uh, two different profiles. Uh, the first one is called uh, exponential density profile for dark matter distribution. And the second one is Burkett profile. We performed the same um, analysis. Uh, we obtained the same dependence for all these quantities mentioned above. And unfortunately for Burkett profile, for exponential sphere profile, there was no uh, visual differences um, in these uh, pictures. So in order to see if they are really different from each other or they are similar, we wanted to see some numbers. And uh, plus we also compared the case, not only with two profiles, but also with two uh, pressure cases, when we have isotropic pressure and when we have um, tangential pressure only. So the first table uh, is related to exponential sphere density profile. And here we have two cases with isotropic pressure and tangential pressure. In the case of isotropic pressure, one should solve TOV equation. And um, as a consequence of TOV equation, there will be finite size of dark matter envelope. But in the case of tangential pressure, one doesn't have TOV equation and the, um, the size uh, of dark matter envelope or the surface of dark matter can be arbitrary. So for the sake of comparison, we have chosen these values for density, for central density, and uh, for isotropic case, we have also central. Okay, this is not actually central. This is the uh, pressure at boundary at uh, RB. So when we solve TOV, uh, we also get the metric functions. Once we have metric functions, we have metric itself. And then uh, knowing the metric, we can calculate all quantities, including E square radius. So for isotropic case, we have E square radius uh, given in this table. For tangential pressure, we also have, and as you can see, they are quite close to each other. And for isotropic case, we have um, uh, finite size of dark matter distribution and this is the surface values of dark matter and um, in order to compare these two cases we just adopt also this value for tangential case and calculate the mass and actually the mass is the same for both cases because the mass profile uh, is function of uh, density and uh, we don't have the tangential pressure. So the mass always the same at this distance. So we did the same computations with Burkett profile and we obtained similar results. So, and that's why we didn't include in the plots these results because visually they're indistinguishable. So in the conclusion, I would like just uh, to mention that the main objective of this talk was to see how dark matter affects the luminosity of accretion disk around static black hole. Um, we showed that the E score radius in the presence of dark matter will be different from uh, six black hole mass uh, as in the case of Schwarzschild black hole. We also analyzed uh, the motion of test particles uh, in this geometry and uh, calculated the flux uh, luminosity of the accretion disk. And um, we showed that owing to the fact that ESCOM 
will be smaller than six black hole mass, the flux and differential luminosity will be higher in the presence of dark matter. And um, uh, also, uh, this one is related to the last picture that I showed you. In the presence of dark matter, the spectral luminosity is higher at higher frequencies and lower at lower frequencies with respect to the black hole in vacuum. But um, at lo low frequencies, the spectral luminosity shows a different behavior in our model as compared with the CAR black hole, suggesting that it might be possible at least uh, to test the validity of the model. And um, we suppose that a uh, supermassive black hole in the distant universe, if surrounded by a sufficiently dense dark matter envelope, uh, may be less massive than current, currently estimated. Um, because uh, somehow when we estimate um, the mass of a supermassive black holes, we ignore the contribution of dark matter. So as prospects, we would like uh, to extend this work, uh, including modified or extended theories of gravity. Uh, this can be also extended by including magnetic field and charges of both black hole and uh, particles, test particles. Uh, one can also consider different uh, models like fermionic model or bosonic models of dark matter. And of course, we wanted to see uh, the same configuration for rotating black hole using the care metric, but unfortunately, we know that there is no interior solution for the care metric and we just gave up the situation uh, because people are trying to find interior solution for the care metric over the last 50 years and nobody succeeded, unfortunately. So um, this is the result. And of course, uh, this paper has not been published yet. It was just submitted to the journal and you can find details of the presentation Ah, okay, in our, in our um, okay, paper uploaded on archive. So that's it. Thank you for your attention and time. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, let's see if we have uh, any questions from the audience. Please, you may switch on your microphone. Okay. Any questions? Well, I have myself some questions. Maybe uh, <clears throat> I start then we can add some more. Uh, uh, Quanta, if I understand correctly, the idea here is uh, to see if you have uh, the presence of dark matter right uh, near the black hole, uh, around the black hole, you can enhance uh, the emission by this presence of dark matter. So in, in physically speaking, you have this tangential pressure which mimics in certain sense uh, rotation of black hole. Is this correct? Yes, yes. Uh, but uh, what is the physical reason for, for this uh, uh, tangential pressure and the similarity with rotation? Can you explain in simple terms? Oh, well, in the literature, the tangential pressure usually is assumed uh, to mimic the angular motion of dark matter particles. Because when we started to see some literature we found, and that's why we also wanted to investigate this case. So tangential pressure somehow mimics the angular uh, momentum of uh, dark matter particles in this case. Okay, so in certain sense you assume uh, rotating dark matter, uh, okay, and uh, uh, static black hole essentially, right? This is the 
No, no, no. no? Dark matter distribution is also uh, static because uh, we don't have. Um, oh, so you are talking about velocity dispersion, uh, essentially. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, clear, clear. And uh, then uh, another question is related. If you have uh, this dark matter around the hole, there should be accretion of dark matter to the black hole. Did you try to estimate what is the rate of accretion in this case? Is it comparable to bionic uh, accretion rate? Uh, unfortunately, no, Gregory, because we were interested uh, in the, um, uh, how dark matter influences the geometry around black hole, not the accretion of uh, dark matter itself. We were interested in different uh, topic. So yeah, I think there are works yeah, which include the accretion of dark matter uh, onto the black hole. But here, no, 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 unfortunately, we didn't consider that case. I see. Okay, but just a simple estimate would be sufficient maybe just to say if, if it uh, makes any effect or not, because evidently would be some accretion. Mm, yeah, okay, we will try. We'll try to see in our future. Because we are still waiting for the referee report, maybe we can include that <laughs> as an additional information. Okay, Very thank good. you, Gregory. Very good, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Please feel free to ask. Well, if there are no questions, maybe again, let's thank the speaker. Uh, this is a very, very good talk. Thank you, Fantai. Always a pleasure to have your new, uh, fresh ideas <laughs> with us. <laughs> thank you. And uh, let's uh, go to the uh, next speaker of the session, who is uh, Shishen Tsue. Uh, and uh, he will talk about uh, uh, boson uh, mass uh, tension caused uh, uh, by its right hand uh, right handed gauge coupling at high energies. Uh, okay, Shishank, you have the floor. Please, can you share your Thank screen? Thank you, Gregory. Can I share the screen? Yes, yes. How do I do? Share. Uh, yes. Have you seen? It looks like yes. You okay. Can see your screen. Yes. So, Thank good you. morning, everyone. Please. And thank you, Chair give me this chance to talk about my recent work. The title, the topic is the W boson mass tension. The reason for this, uh, the reason I'm going to present this tension is due to, is caused by the W boson right hand gauge coupling at high energy. So this is the title. And I, as you may already heard, uh, important news, the most important news in this year about this uh, particle physics um, standard model is the CDF collaboration has made a pre uh, elaborate the precision yeah. case of the standard model. Yeah. They found yeah. the sigma, seven sigma tension. When you measure the W boson mass, they found a C seven sigma tension with a value predicted by standard model. So this is one of the important discovery after Higgs boson was discussed. And certainly is has a very important impact for our vision of the standard model, which has been built decades. And standard model law is a particle for particle physics. However, it is particle content, it is particle interacting, has uh, related to all the research from the astrophysics, cosmology, and other topics. And standard model has been built for decades, showing his very successful even in very precise, even, even in agree with the very precise uh, precision measurement. But this year, this year they found the W boson mass since was discovered, I think 30 years ago by Lubia. 
the W boson mass is predicted in the standard model and was discovered. And everything is so successful, but this year they found the seven sigma tension when the major using a uh, very elaborate te te technology, they found there's a seven sigma is certainly out of the standard model expectation. So this, I'm going to show this it is open window to see there's importance the important area or important universe which we are exploring means what we have seen in, in content of the standard model is so successful with the electron, lepton, quark, and all this. But however, from the other side, we see the dark matter particle. We have many other things we have cannot be understood in the particle content and interacting in the framework of standard model. Okay, so this is, you see from two, one hand is a particle phase is so successful. The other hand, we are clearly see there's a dark matter particle, for example. And here, certainly there's a, there's a connection between it. And this connection is, is confirmed, this, this something is confirmed by this six, seven sigma tension in a, in a, in a, in a, it's, it's, um, in a measurement of the W boson mass. So what could be, could, the, the things could be is that dark matter part, the dark size of the standard model, which we know the W boson has uh, only left hand coupling to the right, uh, to neutrino. This very peculiar uh, picture for this uh, W gauge boson, which is very different from uh, electron magnetism, QED. The photon is coupled to the electron, and post uh, left hand electron and right hand uh, posture. However, W boson has very peculiar, this is starting from Fermi, they couple only to the left hand neutrino, uh, left hand neutrino. And later in 1956, the, the, the Li and Yang discovered this priority violation. Means, means, all this means there's a wall of the right hand particle which is totally different from what the world we are living. However, these two worlds are not totally disconnect. This something tell us is why we see that some dark matter particle impact to the world we are observing. Means that world has a very weak coupling to the yeah. world where we have a W boson. So W I'm boson means yeah. in the standard model description, it only cup to the left hand neutrino, okay? And this very beautiful and perfect and then uh, uh, successful even experimentally. But it's very hard from theory, from principle to say, to see why the photon cup to left hand particle and right, part, right hand particle, instead only W boson has this peculiar, seen from the Fermi theory uh, picture, why, where is the right hand neutrino or this, uh, particle right hand wall. And this could be the wall for the dark matter particle. So today, what I try to, to, to present you is, let's see from this sigma tension image precision measurement of the W boson mass, we could find some hints of the W boson, W boson gauge boson coupling, not only to the, to the left hand neutrino, which we know very well and precise measure, but also there's a very weak coupling for some reason, I'm going to explain you, to right hand neutrino, right hand particles, which are candidate of, of the dark matter, uh, dark matter particle for all the kinds. Okay, so what I'm going to, pre I'm going to present you is, the, this right hand wall, how we cup to the left hand wall we are living. So it's go through a uh, um, uh, four female interacting of Fermi type or Lambuyo Nanasino type. And this interacting, so this is uh, the, the topic I'm going to show you. Okay, first now we are talking about theoretical motivation. 
then we are talking about the uh, uh, channel of calculation, and we are talking about experiment, and also we say some prevision, not only for mass, but also for decay width. So now, in addition to the uh, standard model in Lagrangian, which we know from symmetry, from theory, remodelization, all point view of theory, not only, but also experiment, are so perfect agreed. So we have a certainly we, but as we just mentioned, the standard law is so successful, but it's not complete for sure. So what should, would be the beyond the standard, new phase beyond the standard model? Then we have two options. One from a theoretical principle, the other from an experimental observation. So fortunately now today we have a Higgs discover and also this uh, uh, W Boson measurement is done. So from theoretical part, speculation, hypothesis, we start from the, this 2.1, is full fermion type interacting, new interacting, beyond the standard model. But what's reason for this? There are two reasons, purely theoretical reason. One is, one is, we know all the standard model, including all the interacting, but no gravity. So gravity, if you include the gravity, if including gravity, and then all at this high energy scale, all the particles of the standard model particle are massless, because if we consider uh, at the Planck scale, the, the gravity doesn't differentiate the, the, the different particle with the different quantum number of gauge, gauge symmetry. Then they should behave the same in the gravity interacting. So one of uh, one of uh, this uh, interacting is um, for film also the same type of for film interacting is called Einstein Cardan Lagrangian, where you can obtain by integrating all the torsion free, heavy torsion free at the Planck scale. So this after this we can see there's a, this type after integrate the, all this uh, quantum gravity effect which at Planck scale, you can see the quantum gravity interacting with all particles and all particles are behave the same. The interacting, the effect are, are included in this um, coupling, four female coupling. This one reason that we motivate the standard model particle, both left-handed and right-handed, complete. Not only just left-handed, we see in the low energy perfectly, but we also have right-handed. There's no reason at the Planck scale, you differentiate discriminate in these two left-hand wall and right-hand wall. So this one motivation from the einstein cardan lagrangian and then which is in, uh, in, in agreement with the uh, Fermi type, and then Bouillon and Asina type of interacting. The other is uh, from a purely mathematical theorem, which tell us, which is called no-go theorem, which tell us the the bilinear poci bar poci Lagrangian of the female or female, not boson, are not inconsistent, mathematically not inconsistent with the spectrum particle. This is purely topology argument. The condition is bilinear, means like Lagrangian, we usually have poci bar poci, we so. So this tells us the Lagrangian in high energy must be beyond the B linear. It must be four fermion quadrilinear. Okay, B linear means this poci bar poci. So it must be quadrilinear. So these two reasons tell us, though we are not able to for, be for sure uh, it's whether, it's, whether or not it's a reality, but one is no go theorem. No way you can have a bilinear Lagrangian to agree with uh, cutoff due to the quantum gravity at the Planck scale, no way, mathematically. The second is Einstein cutdown Lagrangian you, you obtain by integrate very heavy torsion free, the torsion free, so it's a torsion free. For torsion free should not be there, I'm not going to explain this. So the departing departure for this beyond standard model Lagrangian is this one, for female interacting of female type or Lambouillon and type. 
and particle contain is standard model particle plus right hand particle, which is candidate for all kinds of dark matter particle. They are interact together due to the quantum gravity. They should not differentiate it because they, this right hand, right, left hand should be the, the same equal footing with the gra quantum gravity. And effective interacting is G cut. Okay, this is Lagrangian, but it's far from being enough to have a really physical picture. What we need is ground state. Where is ground state? Where you realize this Lagrangian? So normally people just take and make calculation, this is not far been enough. So we have Lagrangian. We need to know what's ground state. Or from theoretical point of view, we need to know where is really scaling domain for the reality where the, uh, the, of the world. Scaling domain, scaling domain means like uh, our electromagnetism. We are living in the world, okay? If you measure uh, one charge in one centimeter or you measure in, uh, in uh, 100 meter, it has to be the same. Okay, this is just uh, no precise way to say that what is the scaling is. So this way the world we live. So once you give it Lagrange, you need to know where is scaling domain for copying, for the mass, and where you measure. So this Lagrange 2.1 of the Fermi type has two scaling domain. One is known by this, uh, well known by the superconductor, uh, Cooper pair or the story. But the other is rather new, it's a strong copying. So one is uh, well known, this, uh, this weak copying with uh, superconductivity Higgs mechanism, okay? Superconductivity, Cooper pair, all this, this one domain. And this is exactly what we, are at, have, we have seen we have achieved in a, this laboratory, all this standard model, all this universe, all these the, the things we are seeing in this scaling domain, okay? Uh, the energy scale is 250 GB, all this domain. When you scale in, uh, you, you point out that where this reality world is kinetic energy and how this uh, energy vary with respect to this kinetic energy, the, quant the physical quantity is scaling with very localism is very is I, all the other words demonizable means it doesn't change. You measure in centimeter, you measure hundred meter, it doesn't change the result. Okay, so then the other and the other one is in a strong coupling, means this G cost very large and this total new. When in a strong coupling, then there's a new phenomena which I'm going to explain. You okay? The the uh, the usual scaling domain where we Higgs is is you this interacting produce Higgs particle, and so on. Let's explain all the phenomenology of the standard model. A perfectly agree with the experiment. So now we remember this has two scaling domain in a weak coupling of G and a strong coupling of the of the of the G. They are connecting by the scaling of the so-called scaling equation, normalization equation. These people, okay? So in the strong interacting, you have a such particle form, this new discovery, okay? This new thing to the, this low energy standard model and which completed very, yes, the, the particle spectrum is very heavy. And now people, after year and year, people started realize these things happen around at, at uh, TV. And these people is making effort to think that new things should be living in the TV scale, not only as expect in the, in the unification scale or the scale far from beyond uh, the capacity, uh, uh, accelerating capability. But now the hope, the, now the light is seen, the light seen is new scale is about TV. So, and this is, uh, uh, so in a TV, you have, uh, have uh, this, uh, this article, uh, this uh, in interacting, okay? And then this interacting will give following the standard, uh, this, uh, this uh, how do I call it, this uh, superconductor, this um, superconductor theory, 
you have a Kuba pair, you have spontaneous symmetry breaking, you generate a mass, and, and this is a perfect establish. Okay, and then is uh, in this re in this scaling regime, you have uh, this uh, gap equation for how this uh, top quark is generated, how the scale of the W boson is generated, and this called gap equation also in Cooper pair theory. And in this in this regime, uh, you have effect like Langton, which all the scaling means. They are like QED, as an example I say. You have this all the Lagrangian in this uh, standard model cases. But all the parameter here before we haven't measured, but now we measure Higgs bosons major and W boson masses major. So we can well determine how the behavior of this uh, this Lagrangian. Before we, if you expect this, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, correct uh, Lagrangian, however, if we don't have measurement, we still cannot determine. So once we have this effect Lagrangian, we have this all, this uh, scaling and all this, uh, how it's changing with energy, in a sense, what I said before, we see after Higgs is discovered, after Higgs mass measure, we see this Lagrangian, this coupling, goes like this. This is for this uh, quartical coupling of, of the Higgs, Higgs potential. Okay, this uh, you cover coupling of the Higgs potential. You see this cross, this quartical coupling become negative, means energy of the ground state is not bound from below. He, he, he cannot be stable, he run away, and this cannot be realized as reality or if energy is not bound from below. And this point is just give you 5.1 TV. So this low, this, 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 this solution is extrapolate to high energy. However, he give you from this quartical coupling, energy from not bound from below to show it happen at 2.5 TV. That means in a 2.5 TV, you have something that you have something beyond the standard model. So how do you get this? Thank to the discovery of the Higgs mass, you put into equation, and then you solve equation, it go like this, because this equation is a differential equation, ordinary, first order. So once you have boundary condition, measured by experiment, the solution is completely defined. And before the Higgs discovery, this is impossible. Because if you have equation, but it can be have many types of solution up to the boundary or, or, or up to the measurement. So Higgs discover give this this bound give this phenomena at high energy 5.1 TV. Remember this number, okay? And now people are really look at 5. Point, uh, this uh, TV range instead like uh, people thinking there's some 10 to the 10 GV, uh, thinking about God scale. That's far beyond from our, our, our capability to reach. So once you solve this one, you found, sorry, you found this five, this TV, five TV, found this, now there's a fine tuning is no longer there because we recall the, the supersymmetry. Why the supersymmetry? Because they found this, uh, this uh, Higgs boson when you, 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 you calculate the in the leading order measurement, okay? It's uh, for example, uh, 130 GB. When you theory, you go to next order, you found it's far beyond from that, it's not consistent. That's why they need to a supersymmetry particle to cancel the things you don't want. This is why the supersymmetry introduced has been working a decades and decades. But now if this lambda is five TB, it turned out to be this no fine tuning. Something just happened fine to five TV. The cup equation is no longer fine tuning to the decimal of the, I don't know how much order. So this was supposed message for these things happen in the five TV where this composite particle is, is produced. All this composite particle is produced. Okay. The composite particle, why is a 5 TV? Because at a 5 TV, 
the open another war with this energy scale where the particle spectrum is changed is no is it still are the standard model particle elementary particle but they form together as a composite particle either both both boson and fermion it take it like give you give you example like qcd in a very high energy you see the quark and gluon but in a low energy, we see the hydrons, pions, uh, protons, neutrons. Okay, this is like something in a neutron star. If you energy reach low energy, what you see is a is hydron world. Okay, this is reality world, it's a scaling world. That's what I, I give example. However, if you go to high energy, high density, you see the quark and gluon. This is another scaling world, as in practical QCD scaling, they are also, also demonstrated. So there's two scaling world. They, 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 they scaling, they, they, they transition from one to the other, okay? With strong coupling in the hydrogen world, okay? You see the composite particle, okay? However, in the weak coupling, high energy, you see the, individual, you see the elementary particle with the quark and gluon. So there's two world. I just give you this example as a QCD to tell you there are two world of scaling well, it's two both are reality. One is a composite hydrogen world. The other is a, is a syntactic, a syntactic quark and core. So here it happens the same thing, okay? Similar, okay? So in a uh, in, uh, in, uh, weak coupling world, standard model we know quite well and the major quite well, but however, we see that some discrepancy comes up. But now we want to see what's a, uh, high energy war, the other war, where the composite particle is there, how the effect, anything effect on the low energy <clears throat> measurement, like a seven sigma W boson uh, discrete uh, tensor. So in uh, this is a uh, uh, things we see, okay? So now in, we go to the more concrete example is this W boson. So W boson, I say from the very beginning, is only left-hand coupling to a neutrino. But now all reasoning I say low maybe is not complete to explain. We expect the W boson has a right-hand coupling to the right-hand wall of the right-hand neutrino, dark matter particle, all this. And it must receive some contribution to its mass from the contribution on this dark wall, right-hand wall, not only from the, uh, from the normally quark, uh, uh, left hand neutrino this. So we can parameterize this right hand coupling of the W person in this way. So this new effective coupling, with, which is energy, mo energy momentum dependence, okay? But however, it's right hand, okay? This is not in a standard model. Standard model W person only left hand coupling, legit, okay? So, but however, it's perfect, agree with the parity, parity Violating is a perfect equilibrium experiment and things. But now we see all we discuss and we have this right-hand coupling to the right-hand neutrino that could be the quantitative particle of the, right, of the dark matter. And this coupling is energy dependent. In low energy, this coupling is vanishing. Okay, that's why it has to be agreed with the low energy standard model measurement theory that been verified. However, in high energy, in high energy, in high energy, this can be significantly different from zero. And this could be, this could be, has contribution to the collection to W motion mass observed by seven sigma discrepancy from expectation and from the standard model expectation value. So this is the concrete example, we try to calculate, use to calculate to show why the W boson mass are different from the standard model expectation. Okay, so then this one is energy momentum dependent, point one. Point two, at low energy is same as standard model. At high energy, it has uh, this uh, composite particle and parity, I forget to mention in high energy, when the composite, composite boson fermion, the parity symmetry is completely restored. Not completely, it's going to, it's, it's, it's because in low energy, W zones parity 100% violate. 
Violet means it's a couple only left hand, left hand neutrino, not right hand at all. However, high energy this double boson coupling parity is restored by this participator right hand particle of dark matter particle. And this coupling is restored. And, but in low energy, the coupling is very weak. That's why we don't see it. But in high energy, we will see when the energy reach. But this high energy now is not so high. It's just a TV. It's not what expected. It's very high, unreachable. But it's just TV. OK, so now let's see more detail about this coupling. So coupling, because in moment, energy moment dependent, we need to see the several case, how is energy moment dependent. So here, I don't go to detail for a couple of cases, which has been analysis, but in most cases, they are very small, about 10 to minus four. When you square, it's very small. That's why they don't, cannot be, defined, cannot be uh, seen in low energy, difficult to be seen in low energy experiment. So this is a diagram to show you why the W boson through this Fermi type interacting can cup to right hand particle. Here I right hand, I as a user as a representative top and bottom, but it can be right hand neutrino and all right hand is a, 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 a part of the world of right hand particle. So now what I have several cases which I'm not in, uh, no interest in this calculation. The things I want to talk so is this one. When the energy, the particle, the coupling is very high, okay? And uh, the, 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 the SW boson energy Q is not small, is small. This coupling is go like this way, okay? This is four female coupling. This lambda is five TeV. And because of this, we see this coupling, low still very small. However, if you consider it contribution by loop, first leading of the loop contribution to W boson mass, it is, has no neck. Well, he has a contribution. And I'm going to show this contribution is can be, can be re released or can release this seven sigma can be explained, can explain this seven sigma discrepancy of W boson mass precision measurement from this uh, standard model expectation model. So this is uh, coupling waves. Not on this, okay? In general, we have this generalized coupling of W boson from all the theory to not only left-handed, this part is standard model. Now we have right-handed, okay? Which, which should be played a role in high energy. Okay, and here the mixing angle, this uh, associated with all type of particle and dry hand mixing, all this, I'm not going to detail. I just give you the main idea is dry hand is this low energy is standard model. Now we are talking about right hand particle, energy dependent and can couple all right hand layer, 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 layer dark, dark matter particle. Uh, this dark matter particle is very weak up in, in as real particle, but as a quantum fluctuation and loop, they contribute indeed to the W boson mass through this term. Okay, not only W boson, here we also consider, you know, this uh, um, uh, Salam, one big Salam model, you will consider other component gauge boson, G boson, so, okay, here I just emphasize W boson. So now, up to then, we start to calculate this, this, cup, uh, this correction from this additional right hand coupling of the proposal to right hand particle, right hand state and neutrino, for example. This is called uh, the, the, the one of the candidate dark matter particle. So we calculate their contribution to W boson mass correction. And this calculation is not very difficult. Not only we uh, have, we not only it, it's just because every because left hand coupling is a well established calculation. So we have right hand just in the same way, but coupling is different. So we get the W boson propagate, and it is mass term here has a corrections. 
has correction. This term is upon a standard model and all other parameters were defined by a standard model. And now you have a corrections from right-hand coupling. And here, very fortunate, we know, we know, we know that lambda correlation scale is about TV from the reason I said before. And this energy, this energy dependence, okay, Q is energy dependent. And here there's some coefficients, okay, due to the, uh, the, the right-hand coupling we will introduce. And the same thing for a zeta portion. So then we can decide it by the standard procedure, we decide it is uh, W boson mass and zeta boson mass. They're all things same as standard model, which have been very, very precisely checked. But now this new term comes about, okay? New correction comes. I call this new correction a right-hand corrections, okay? Because there are many corrections which has been calculated in very precise two loop, three, but very hard work to have been calculated. And all these calculations are present in a G2, standard model result, this so-called form factor. So now all things are the same because the symmetry is the same, um, particle contains the same, it's just there's additional right-hand coupling with the same structure. So then you have this right-hand coupling correction term with the scale energy lambda, we know it, 5 TV from other reason we see, okay? So the same for a zeta boson. Then we have only thing which we are, the, the parameter left here is the, the left-hand coupling, which cannot be completely uh, determined from the four fermion interacting because you have a scaling law, and in a strong coupling is not uh, everything my analytical computable. However, no matter what, as we, the reason we say before, the lambda is five TV, okay? So if these things go in the right spot, this lambda, this lambda parameter should be order one. It cannot be something ridiculous, otherwise, which means since it's not consistent. So lambda is 5 TV and these things must be order one. Then we check with a new experiment, precision measurement of W boson mass, MW, seven sigma away from the standard model expectation. We check with result with this formula, 6.4. So let me just try to repeat again. The standard model is all the correction, very heavily work a decade and decade, calculate this. They're very, very good with the experiment. But now they see this two term, this term one leading order term has seven sigma discrete, discriminate with experiment. Okay. They, they, and now the result I'm present here is I have this term. Okay. And I say the lambda is 5 TV and this C is order one parameter to be a consistent and Okay, so now let's see this with the experiment. And other things I think is some more detail, some more uh, uh, energy dependent. And okay. So this experiment result, the plot I took from the CDF measurement. Okay, the, the, let, 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 let's see, let's see this uh, violet, line is standard model result, okay? This way, line. And there's a couple of years ago, there's some measurement. Uh, this dash line, great dash line, already saw there's some deviation from this, uh, this standard model expectation. Okay, however, still in the two or three sigma. But this year, this new measurement, this uh, red circle is come here. All oh, this very tiny value, this very small value. I need to very precise measurement. So it come from here. So this from here, this red, uh, red circle and the standard model are well beyond uh, 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 seven sigma. So it's, it's, it's out of this uh, standard model. It's very clearly, okay? So this is why it's very sure the standard model is not complete theory. There's something beyond the standard model and this something has contribution to W boson mass 
Now, today, it's been measured uh, very precisely. And this standard model, the measure is up, I think, for 30 or 40 years past. So, so here, there's a well-populated supersymmetry theory. They say that also the supersymmetry particle, you can imagine, has a contribution, additional contribution to W boson masses. And that this contribution certainly it depends on parameter of supersymmetry theory, and it can be released, it can be, can be in the right direction, because you see the W bone model, it gets some new contribution. That's why from standard model, you receive calculate all possible contribution, very complicated, it's really hard work to consider all this, but now he definitely there's some new contribution above the standard model. So supersymmetry keep this, this green line. Okay, there are many types of supersymmetry. There's a light supersymmetry. Keep addition of super, uh, condition to W boson mass in addition to quite a, a, a standard model one. Okay, this the arranging of parameter of the supersymmetry, this green line. This I took from the, this science paper by CDN and uh, by CDF measurement. So the formula I showed you before is this blue, this blue grid line, okay? With the lambda 5 TB I show you, and the, the order one parameter CJ, CJ, CW, CW, okay? So order one CW can be well covered, uh, it's written, yeah, okay? So the, the line below, is, uh, this uh, this uh, coupling is uh, uh, this uh, parameter is two point one point six one point seven and nine up is two point one, given the lambda is five TV. So this means that this right hand coupling can release the tension, can cover the experimental the new experimental regime. In the other world, the right hand contribution in a logical reasoning line are consistently with experiment with one parameter of CJ, okay, of the uh, order one parameter. Okay, so given this blue grid line. So at least we see the thing is in, in a spot of consistency with additional right hand W sovereign coupling. And this company certainly uh, received some inter, uh, contribution from dark matter particle, quantum fluctuation, okay? If you directly measure this uh, coupling is too small, but when you have a contribution in the loop, you see this effect, okay? And this here, this uh, green line is supersymmetry one, is present by in the sign article. I took this one. I just brought in my result, this green one. So in addition to this, okay, in addition to this, we see not only mass, but we see the width. And I hope this width can be also like a people's mass can be precisely measured. Okay, precise measure. Because this right hand coupling not only give a contribution to, to the mass of W boson and G boson and so on. But it's definitely keep also decay if this is a reality to, to keep a W Z boson decay. Okay. So the, the, the interacting I showed you before, we can use to calculate the width, which also very, very also well measurement, but it's going to be precisely measured, measured. So we can calculate the width. And this width, there's no more. So you see the width here, this is standard model width. After we see very heavy calculate the loop contribution, all this come. Then you, the same additional right-hand coupling I showed you before. So this I call right-hand correction. So right-hand again, lambda scale, energy scale, we know this is most important. Otherwise we really don't know where we are doing things, physics, okay? And the coefficient is must be order one if the scale you are you are doing is correct. So the same with the mass, you have this additional term. 
And this should be verified by precision measurement of decay width of the ribosome. Okay, so in addition to this, there's, there are so many precision measurements. This has to be consistent. Means all what I say, this order one, this is a five point TV has to be consistent with all the other existing measurement. For example, the width, it is all the, this, uh, this width have been measured in, in, in very precise way, 10 to minus four. Okay, I need to be consistent with this to be, to be, to be means I fix this 5.1 TV is fixed by other things. Now I fix this order one parameter to be in this regime. With this, I need to be consistent with all the other precise measurement. Not only I also keep pre prediction of the proposal decay width, width should be received also correct in the same time. There's no room here. Okay, no, no. First, you need to consist in this term. You got this cannot be larger than the, the experiment is already now. Okay, it must be small in arrow bar, inside arrow bar. Okay, but now you calculate this term. You say, okay, if you're able to, in future, you're able to pin down arrow bar, you will find the, 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 the description of more than five sigma with this term from the right hand copy. So this all things I'm going to, to, to present you. But later I make some remark is this picture I want to show you is this right hand and left hand asymmetry. So as we say that the standard model W boson has a peculiar feature, which is only copied right left-handed. So however, this uh, presentation we saw there's some very really tiny right hand coupling of the proposal with uh, this uh, dark matter particle so so this can this the, the, if you go to precisely measurement okay in a, in a, then you will you must be finding some difference between left and right okay so you see you can yes. easily construct this uh, asymmetry i'm going to finish this asymmetry parameter okay asymmetry parameter means interacting cross section whatever you want here I'm putting genetic, this is standard model, well measured and very accurate measure. Then you can say, oh, there's other things which are not zero. In the standard model is zero, it's not zero, which is small uh, right-hand coupling, okay? And put this ratio, left minus right and then divide left plus right, put this ratio. And for the same reason arguing that we this one should be one if it's standard model. And if you deviate from one, one by this term from right hand coupling, receiving with this unknown, no unknown, this, uh, this uh, right hand dark matter particle contribution, which need to go like this way, minus. So means the deviate. So means this asymmetry is more sensible to, 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 to see left and right contribution and symmetry. But low is, uh, but still, measurement is rather difficult to pin down. This is, I think, at least less than 10 to minus four, four, five. So it's to see if you're able to see this, this will tell you there's such a discrepancy. In conclusion, is in low energy with standard model, we see the only left hand work, but in high energy and with elementary particle of a quark, lepton, neutrino, and so on. But in high energy, TV, now it's very clear, it's TV. In low energy, what I'm talking about is the standard model scale is 250 GV, okay, 200 GV, GV. And if you see one to the, uh, very interesting, if you see this QCD scale, is working at the scaling scale, is working at uh, uh, about a, a few hundred math. And QED, electromagnetic, is working about electron masses scale, okay? All these go perfectly realize in a reality world, okay? Now we have a new scaling in a new scaling role happen in the TV energy world, which is not very far from us. This is what HC is effort, making effort to see, to find something. So there, what we expect to see is first, all this uh, elementary standard model part combine to be composite boson and fermion, 
by this uh, lambo senior female type interacting at strong coupling fluid uh, scaling region at an energy TV scale. And at this spectrum, at this spectrum in TV, we are exploring, the, the, the left and right symmetry are completely restored. Not completely, I wouldn't say completely, but it's restored, okay? It's not like a low energy, like what we see the double boson couple with on left and neutrino only. This very peculiar way, very, uh, when it was discovered, is uh, this uh, this parity variation is astonished by all the world because we are we are we are used to with the QED electromagnetism. So, but higher in the TV, what I say is this symmetry is restored. Okay, left and right Good. has to be symmetric, but but realized by what? Not by new particle because they left and right particle they introduce new particle, new mass, new parameter, but not by left but by the particle of standard model, which we know it now, in addition to dark matter particle, they are interact together in terms, in, in terms of the female type, lambo for female interacting, due to the two reasons, why is Einstein cut down Lagrangian, the other reason is mathematical, no go theory. So this, this keep two dynamics. One is low energy, weak coupling. You give a standard model, perfectly agreed with man, uh, expanding low energy. The other is at TV, you have a very strong coupling. You combine all these standard model particles, including the dark matter particle, right hand particle, to be a left and right symmetry wall. And this wall is no way far from us, but he has some cor correction to what we measure in low energy, the W boson mark, it mass example. So we are expecting this uh, lambda 5 TV wall where the left and right symmetry is restored. So I'm finishing. Thank you very much of this uh, splendid talk, Shisheng. And uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, 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 thank you very much. I am trying to see the screen to take to show me. And uh, well, thank you very much for this uh, very, very important talk and this uh, new approach using Nambu Yaonalazinio uh, Lagrangian. And uh, I extremely appreciated your uh, introductory remarks to the difficulty of um, the determination of um, uh, encountered by uh, the work, the traditional work of Carlo Rubia and see the possible new outlook. All you said is very, very important and I look forward to a formal presentation in the next days, possibly before the end of the meeting to send a, a first publication on this point. But I would like to add you only one point which I think of two points, which we are uh, facing for the first time in uh, astrophysics. We have been looking at uh, X-ray, at MEV, even at JEV observed in gamma ray burst. But uh, today for the first time, both in BDHN1 and BDHN2, we see very clear evidence of five TEV emission, which is still mysterious. Therefore, in addition to the general remark you made in the introduction, we should add this uh, recent uh, observation of five TEV emission, both in BDHN1 and BDHN2. And uh, I look forward 
to discuss with you in the next days this splendid work and congratulate you again. Did you get these points? Yes, Were you please. online? Yes, yes, I'm on online. I see you as soon as possible. Okay, I am here. Okay. Uh, may I ask a question? Yes, please. Yes, yes. Okay, yes, thank, thank you for the very interesting talk. Actually, Shesheng, I have a question regarding the estimation that you got on this right-hand coupling. Is it consistent with that value that we got in the Xenon experiment? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, because yes, indeed, I list list, but I have not, there are at least uh, four, three, four cases. Yes, it, it is. Because because I saw you, you got this something like 10 to minus four. Uh, it is different, is the, okay, if you like, I go to, okay, I go to, I go to, I go to, okay, so, you know, it's a question on energy moment dependent of the, this new coupling. Okay, so <clears throat> in the Zynon case, let me see. Okay, here it is. In 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 the Zynon case, is um, it should be because in the Zynon case, external momentum and uh, is uh, is a low, low energy. Okay, it's the low energy. Okay, because uh, because uh, this uh, dark matter particle is uh, you are detecting, you know, in the Zynon case, you are you are trying to detect some signal direct to the dark matter particle. So this uh, dark matter particle is in low energy, external momentum. Okay, so this is case uh, case uh, case uh, case one. Okay, instead here is case two. This things inside loop. So this one, the W boson is low energy, which you are measuring. Okay, which your major. However, this uh, two particle is cup P prime P low energy is momentum of this uh, particle you uh, W boson cup you you cup two in inside the loop means is a is a quantum fluctuation field is no reality field so momentum can be very high okay can be very high if a particle is in reality you detecting low energy detector the low energy detector only see the low energy momentum. Of the dark matter particle, but if you in loop, you inter you need to integrate all the possible moment momenta. So it's in these cases, okay. So in these cases, this is, uh, dependence is different from the Zynon cases, okay. It's different in the Zynon case. Here is no square, okay. In Zynon, if I, I need to be remember, I have poor memory now, but I need to see. So here is different is in Zynon case, the Zynon detector is trying to see the dark matter particle as external matter particle. And certainly Zynon instrument is detecting only low energy stuff, okay? Yes. So, yes. okay, then, yes. then this vortex reduce one. Oh. But here oh. the difference is the W contribution from W boson mass is come from the all possible for quantum fragile inside loop, all type of particle. And for a standard model particle, we know precisely calculate. But if it's something you don't know, you know in the model. If you are reality, you have to contribute and measure it on the discrepancy. And in this is the, the model we see in these cases, the, 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 the momentum can be very high because inside quantum fluctuation is not really like a xenon. You detect this uh, this uh, you know this uh, this particle as a as a external particle. Okay, it's a quantum fluctuation. You can run a very high energy up to lambda, so the couplings go the other way. It's not square. Yes, I see. Oh, I okay. Th thank you very much, uh, okay. Shen. Thank you, Sir, for your question. And I think we are uh, slightly behind the schedule. We should so if, okay. move thank on. You. Thank, thank you, you Shen. I also have some real questions later. Thank you very much. Let's uh, thank again the speaker, and we move to the next speaker of the morning session. Uh, this is uh, Narek Sarkian. Uh, Narek, please, can you share your screen? Yes, if Shushank stops to share, I can start to share. Yes. No, it doesn't let me. Okay. 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 I think now you see my screen, yes? Yes, we can see your screen. And do you see my pointer also? Uh, no. Let's see the pointer. Okay. 
Okay, no problem. But, but the screen is okay. Yes, yes, you may, you may start. Okay, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thanks. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to present the recent works that I was doing with my group in the school, in the summer school. I'm going to speak about uh, blazers in multi-messenger era. So uh, as you know, this is a, a very new, very fresh topic because in a, a few years after the observation of the neutrinos, first time observation of neutrinos from AGNs, from blazers, this opens new topic and new perspectives to study these objects. So I'm going to show some of the results that we obtained in uh, past one or two years. Uh, I'm going to speak mostly about blazers, so I make some short introduction. What are the blazers? So as you know, active galactic nuclei are the galaxies which have the central uh, core, which is very bright. So this luminosity could exceed the, the part of the remaining galaxy, many order of magnitude. These are called active galactic nuclei. And some of these active galactic nuclei, they have the jet structure, which is starting from uh, the central supermassive black hole. And depending on the orientation of this jet, uh, there are different appearances of these AGNs. The most uh, extreme type of agents are brothers. Uh, this is when you have that jet is making a very small angle with respect to the observer. And considering that the, the plasma in the jet is moving with relativistic velocities, then you have the Doppler amplification of the radiation. And so you can observe these brothers even in very high redshifts. And studying them, this is a, a, they are nice tools to study the large scale structure of the universe. So blazers, there are different ways, different methods to classify these objects, but the two main classification, which also affects the physics of the sources is based on the emission lines that we are observing or not observing in the optical band. So the FSRQs, flat spectrum radio quasars, these are the blazers when in the optical band, we see these emission lines and different uh, wavelengths. So this shows that there are some internal structure in the central nuclear that we see and BLX, which are completely almost featureless. It means that you don't see any observation lines or these lines are very weak, so you cannot observe them. As I mentioned, the, uh, these two classification has a strong effect also on the physics of these objects. So these are now I'll show you in a few slides. So uh, one of the most uh, observational feature of blazers is the uh, extreme variability in all frequencies. So the, the, the emission that we are observing is variable in all bands. Uh, here, uh, the emission from blazers we observe from radio to high and very high energy gamma ray bands. As a comparison, here is shown uh, the jetted AGNs and non-jetted AGNs. So with the black lines, you see that is the spectrum of non-jetted AGNs. So in the, let's say, best cases, their spectrum can reach up to X-ray band, like 400 keV. This is very narrow. Instead, for the jetted AGNs, blazers, which uh, you see that the observation goes from radio to high and very energy gamma ray bands. So it practically means that all the existing telescopes that we have now can just point to the direction of the blood and make an observation. And you can collect a, a, a valuable information that you could study the emission properties of these sources. Uh, another classification, which is uh, very important for blazers and to understand them, is based on the peak of the synchrotron component in the spectral energy distribution. This is uh, so when you have the peak of the synchrotron component that is less than 10 to 14 hertz. So these are called low synchrotron picket objects. When it is between 10 to 14, 10 to 15, it's are called intermediate synchrotron picket objects. And when you have that is above 10 to 15 hertz, you have these high synchrotron picket objects. This difference in the synchrotron peak is directly uh, dependent on the acceleration and emission processes in these objects. So when you have the different uh, type of blazers, you see different processes that are responsible for particle emission. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, one of the key features of blazers is the variability and is observed in all the frequencies that are currently we are observing in different uh, telescopes. So here is shown the light curve of 3C454 blazers. 
in gamma ray on the top panel, the X-ray, the blue data points in optical and UV bands. As you can see in all the bands, you see that this flux is sometimes in a very low state, then sometimes it is increasing and it's going down. So if we just zoom in the gamma ray band, this is showing the flux changes in the gamma ray band. So you see this is in logarithmic scale. For example, when the source is in a low emission state, the particle flux is around 10 to minus eight. But when it goes to in the bright state, it's 10, more than 10, 10 to minus five, which, is, which means that the factor of change is like thousand, so three order of magnitude change in the flux. Uh, actually, this is uh, quite bright because uh, when the flux is 10 to minus 15, the luminosity of this object is 10 to 50 arc per second. So in that uh, flare period, this is becoming one of the brightest source in the gamma ray sky. So this, uh, uh, this observation that are shown here, it means that we are collecting a lot of information and then uh, it means that we can investigate to study the emission of these blazars, not only in a single period, but we can look of different uh, periods, how this emission is changed. So we need to implement new methods that to visualize or to study uh, the, the spectra of the sources, which is down here. So basically, uh, this is called set light curve animation. What is the idea behind this is that you split the gamma ray light curve. Why gamma ray light curve? Because we have the continuous observation of these sources since 2008 by Fermi Lat telescope. So you split the light curve of this uh, in gamma ray band in Bayesian blocks into the Bayesian blocks. So for each block, you have the constant flux. The flux is generally variable, but you split in the short intervals that statistically are consistent, consistent with the constant flux. And for each of these blocks, you compute the gamma ray spectra and the spectra so in optical, UV, X-ray, and radio, in a, practically in all the bands that you have. So in the uh, so upper panel here is shown the gamma ray light curve and uh, the lower panel is the uh, spectrum for, uh, in the first moment that you observe this source. Then when you put these uh, data points together, you can see how this emission is changing in time. So you see these red points that they are appearing and disappearing are the emission of the source in different periods. So practically you move the time and each time you have different spectra of the source. So this way you are able to follow what is the dynamical change of the source emission over the time. And it is uh, with the gray uh, this area, we show the amplitude of the variation. So you see how the spectrum is changing in time, but also you see the amplitude in different bands how it is changing. So this, this is quite important because it allows you to look how uh, not only in a single period in a snapshot that you take the picture, the emission of the source, but instead you can see how this emission is changing in time, which is very important for the theoretical study that I'll show you in a few slides. So uh, when we show this light curve uh, of the flux changes in different bands, this is not only that gives you the magnitude or the order of the change of the flux, but also it provides you significant info, so it provides you an important information on the processes that is taking place in the sources. For example, this is another light curve of Bielako blazar. And you see again the variation in gamma ray, optical, X-ray, UV, and all the bands practically. But if you do look very close to the X-ray band, uh, this is the light curve in X-ray band compared with the photon index in the X-ray band. Uh, I don't, unfortunately, okay, now it's back now. Uh, you can see also that there are two periods when the X-ray emission was very strong in flaring state. So the first, uh, during the first flare that you can see that the photon index also is changing. So it goes from uh, hard to the soft index. But what is more interesting when you look to the second flare that is occurring, occurring in the last period of the observation, together with the flux increase, you see that the photon index is changing. So it's becoming more softer. So this is uh, very important because it shows that the physics, the physics are processes are responsible for these flares were different. So in order to, to better see this, if we just plot the photon index in X-ray band with the flux, in the first, uh, on the left panel, you see that this is during the first flare, on the right is the second flare. You see that in the first time you have this classical behavior that we observe in many blazers. So you have the increase of the flux and you have the hardening of the photon index, which is very natural because increase of the flux means that you have more particles injected, which are more energetic than which results in the hard photon index. 
But in the second flaring case, you see that together with the increase of the flux, you see that the photon index is becoming softer, which is very unusual behavior. Let's call it softer when brighter trend, and it has been observed only for a few blazers. So this simple comparison shows that uh, these flares, they were caused by very different processes. To visualize this in, on the below, you see the spectrum of this blazer which is just zoomed in the region where uh, is optical UV and X-ray band. So in a normal state, when the emission is observed, you have the optical UV data that are most likely from the synchrotron emission of the electrons. Then this rising, increasing shape of the X-ray band, you have the inverse Compton scattering of internal or external photons. So this is the normal regular when the source is emitting. But what is happening during this flowering state, you see that you have dramatic change of the X-ray component. Uh, now, this is not anymore as a synchrotron, uh, as an inverse Compton emission of the same electrons, and it cannot be explained by uh, the same synchrotron component because it's the shifted to the higher frequencies. So this shows that uh, even if we are studying the same source, and if you point to the, this object in a different periods, you can see very different physical processes. But this is so important when you collect everything together and you can just put all together and you can see what is the ch changes in the source emission over the time. The blazers are the dominant extragalactic sources in the gamma ray sky, so it means that, uh, for example, in the fourth FGL catalog, there are around like 5,000 blazers, and most of them are detected above 100 MeV band. So this makes them a very interesting object to point and to study with different objects. Uh, so you can construct the spectrum from radio to high energy gamma ray band. But what is more interesting, uh, 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 there are some new types of blazers that with Paolo Giomini, we call them like transient blazers. And this is basically based on the future that we have observed for a very peculiar blazer. So the light curve that is shown here might appear very uh, traditional standard light curve of blazers, but this blazer was unique and it had a different uh, properties. So this source was known to emit in the, from the radio observation, it was known to be a, a blazer, an AGN, but it was never observed in the X-ray or in gamma ray band, never. It didn't show any sign of the emission. And suddenly in 2017, for a very short period, this was very bright and become a very strong emitter and was observed by gamma ray instrument and X-ray instruments. And it showed the uh, a change of the emission. So here again, we show this set light curve of this object. So this initial period, you see that there is practically almost no detections. You don't get signal, signal is very weak. You don't see any kind of emission. Then what is happening with this object? You see that in time, its spectrum is increasing in the gamma ray, in X-ray and optical band, it is becoming a very bright object. For a few months, it remains very active. So you, you see that X-ray band, you have a very high X-ray flux also in the gamma ray band. Then again, it becomes very weak in the late time of the observation and again, completely disappears from the gamma ray band. So this is why we call this type of sources as a transient blazer. So sometimes they appear, they emit, and they completely disappear. In order to better understand these uh, changes, here is shown the light curve in one, at 1 GV, at 1 KV. So I have to mention that this object was not also detected in RAS surveys in 1990s. So it, didn't show any sign of the X-ray emission. Then you see, so in the initial period of the Fermi observation, this blazer was not detected. So you see on the upper limit. Then uh, from 2016, the end of the 2016, starting from the set 2017, this becomes very bright. You see the flux increases in both in GV and KV band. It uh, emits in both uh, very strong source. Then again, this flux goes down and disappears. You know, when I say that it's becoming very bright source, it's more clear from this comparison, where uh, we compare the uh, emission, the spectrum of this source with the green dot, with uh, 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 the SED of Mark for 501. Of course, we scale the, the flux uh, to match the radio band. 
It is known that Mach 541 is one of the brightest X-ray objects in the skies, which is very bright, shows very strong variability, and it's a lot studied by different objects. With the orange uh, in the X-ray band, with the orange dots, we show the highest and lowest X-ray flux ever observed from Mark 541. When you compare with the green data, you see that the variability of these new transient blazars is even at larger amplitude than with Markarian 541, so, and it was even more brighter than Markarian. So really, this source was very peculiar, and he, for a few months, it was very bright um, in the X-ray and gamma-ray bands. So we have, with Paolo Jami, we are continuing to search this kind of blazars, because uh, if uh, indeed there are really these built transient blazars, we need to make a lot of new computations because they were never considered in any computation when you call, calculate the background or etc. So about the origin of the emission from blazars. So this is the typical spectral energy distribution of Markarian 421, which is very well known blazar. And you see that is uh, when observed with different instruments here with different colors are shown on different measurements. And you see that this is the, this SED shows the two uh, uh, peaks, one in uh, X-ray, another one in uh, MeV, GV band. Uh, this is typical for all blazars. Practically all of them they show this two peak structure in the ACD. And what is known up to now that this first peak is coming from the synchrotron emission of the electrons. And this is well known because of the observed uh, polarization, etc. Many different properties really show that the first component comes from synchrotron emission of the electrons. But the origin of the emission of the second component, the second peak, is still under debate. So there are different scenarios, different models, but if you could generally group them in two subclasses. One is leptonic. It means that this component is produced from the interaction of the electrons, or it can be hadronic. So uh, protons have full or some kind of part of contribution to this component. So these are two scenarios that are mostly discussed now in the literature and uh, usually used to model the ICD of blazars. So what is the difference of well, this, between these two models? So in the leptonic case, you have the emission region, which is inside the jet and is moving with the jet with the relativistic velocities. Then you have the electrons that they are inside this emitting region that they are emitting by synchrotron radiation. Then uh, these uh, photons uh, are again interacting with the electrons by inverse Compton scattering, and we have the second peak. But the second peak could be also the inverse Compton scattering of external photons. So in this slide, it's shown two different type of blazers. These are BLX and FSRQs. Uh, uh, since in BLX, we don't see any internal structure. It means that you have just the emitting region, you have the electrons that and their spectrum is mostly explained by this well-known synchrotron, synchrotron self-compton model. So the same synchrotron photons are interacting with the electrons and they are scattered to the higher energies. But in the case of FSRQ, the, 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 the situation is more complex because they have a very bright uh, accretion disk luminosity or they have the internal structure like broadline region, torus, or the disk photons themselves. So, in general, the emission from this object can be superposition of different components, like is shown in the uh, left bottom uh, plot. You see that different components can together contribute and form the, the spectrum that we are observing in the uh, gamma ray band. So in order to study, uh, to demonstrate uh, the, the emission processes in these blazers and their changes in time, we consider the, the, the following scenario is considered. So you have the jet that is starting from the central black hole, you have the accretion disk, and this emission region is within the broadline region. Then the electrons that are accelerated and ejected in this emitting region, they are interacting with the photons from the disk, from the broadline region, and from the uh, synchrotron photons themselves. And let's see what is uh, the changes in the, uh, uh, in the spectrum of these uh, objects. As an example, I show here two blazers, 3C454 and BLRKERT, which is uh, uh, both of them are typical sources of FSRQ and BLR uh, type of blazers. 
So uh, from the SED like curve animation that I showed you a few slides before, we selected all the data points that have enough data and can be modeled. And for each source, we separated like for 3C 450, for 362 SEDs and for BA like 540 something SEDs. And we model each of them with the within one zone scenario that I discussed in the slide in the previous slide. And each time we model and we try to see how the different components are changing in time. Here in this animation, I show you uh, the, same, the change of the emission and the top of the plots, you see the sort of dates. So different periods, you see the, how the different components are changing in time. For example, on the left panel, you see that you have the disk, uh, this magenta color. You see that there is the thermal emission from the, the, the accretion disk, which is almost, which is constant in time. But the synchrotron component goes up and down, and sometimes it can be above or can be below this thermal emission. So this means that if you observe the source in a single period, maybe you are observing in a low synchrotron state, then you see something else in the optical band. But if you observe in a bright synchrotron state, then you don't see this accretion disk emission or etc. So it means that uh, if you are considering only a single episode, single period of the source emission, you can make derive some conclusions that are not valid for the other periods because these are characterized by very variable emission in time. Uh, as a result of this modeling, um, below the panels, I show the total uh, spectrum that models that we obtain uh, from the modeling all of these uh, ACDs. And you see that uh, the theoretical modeling also show that you have high amplitude changes in different events. And for example, on the left, you see that the synchrotron emission sometimes can be really below the thermal emission from the disk, but sometimes also it can be more than the, this component. And so the same variability we see in the X-ray and high energy gamma ray band. But of course, this modeling is not just to show how the components are changing in time. But uh, for, from each of these uh, SED modelings, you could derive important parameters that are explaining the distribution of the electrons, the jet itself, the luminosities, et cetera. For example, here is shown the uh, power law indexes of electrons before and after the break, uh, Doppler boosting factor of the jet, uh, maximum uh, minimum energy of the electrons, magnetic field, and etc. So when you combine all these the things, you see that what is the physical parameters changing in time? For example, how uh, what is happening with the source when you have in a very high flaring state? So what is causing these flares? For example, in this case, this is 300, 3C454. So when you have a flare, the Doppler boosting factor is significantly increasing. So it means that the contribution is coming from the blobs that they are starting to move much faster than the previous. And this is why you see these flaring events. You can also estimate the jet luminosity, the magnetic field, the changes in time. So this is very, uh, a lot of information that you could study and uh, to interpret within the one of the acceleration scenarios or etc. to see if you are able to reproduce such changes in the electrons or not. This is about the uh, leptonic part. So I move the second uh, part of my presentation, which is about these blasters, the KS0546, and I call it new era. Why new era? Because after the observation of these blasters, they started a new field called multi-messenger observation of blasters. So in two, uh, what is multi-messenger observation is that you have the object that is emitting. Uh, before now, uh, until now, we were able to detect the electromagnetic components. So basically, you had the different instruments. You de detected the electromagnetic emission, and you're trying to uh, study this object. But uh, of course, when you get a signal from single messengers, you are always limited. So sometimes you cannot distinguish between different components, and uh, this is making a problem for uh, a deeper understanding of these objects. But now what is happening is that together with the photons, you are able also to observe neutrinos. So for the same object, you can study using two messengers. This is why it's called multi-messenger observation. So you get information both from the photons and from the neutrinos, and these two together, if you put, you can make a much deeper investigation of the processes happening in blazer jets. So in 2017, uh, on September 22, there was a neutrino event observed by ice cube detector. The energy of this event was 290 TV. 
But of course, the most important was not this energy because much more energetic neutrinos are until up to now observed by ice group. But what was interesting that this the arrival direction of this neutrino was uh, coinciding with a known blazer. And what was what, what was more interesting that these blazers, as shown by magic and Fermilat observation, was in a very high state in the gamma ray band. So it means that we have a blazer that is very flaring in the gamma ray band, and you detect some neutrinos coming from uh, the same direction. So this is why in, immediately it uh, have a strong resonance in the community. So all the telescopes that are practically operating, they pointed to this direction of the sky and try to collect some data. And this is the ACD shown here, uh, which was the most complete information that we were collected from the observation of blazers because it contains the multivalent data plus the constraints from the neutrino observation. So this was very attractive and this was immediately published in science. But of course there was some debate uh, because people were mentioning that you have a single neutrino event and it, it, it is not clear when you will observe the next neutrinos and might be limited this field. But what was interesting in the high school collaboration, when they look back to the data that previously they observed, they found that in 2014-15, in some 110 days window, they were uh, from the same direction, there was uh, 13 plus minus five neutrinos above the background level. The detection significance was is 3.5 sigma, and this is why at that, that point there was not, they didn't report these things. But now that you know that in that direction there is a neutrino emitter, uh, this result is more than convincing that you are observing neutrino flares. So you had in 2017 a single neutrino, but from the same object, the same direction, now you see some more number of the neutrinos. And now there was the second question, if is the same source is really responsible for the neutrino emission in both cases. So in the bottom panel, bottom left, is shown the light curve of this Texas 0506 brothers during the, uh, when the neutrinos were observed in 2015 and the neutrino in 2017. So with the red dashed line is the period when the neutrino was observed. So you see that the source really was in very active flowering state. But when you look back in 2014, 15, the source is not really promising, it's not in flowering, it's not in active state. So this was uh, why people were a little bit uh, careful uh, interpreting the same sources responsible for the neutrino, but we showed together with some colleagues, we were able to show that uh, during this neutrino flare emission, the high energy gamma ray spectra of this source is uh, changing dramatically. So above 10 GV, you see two periods when the photon spectrum is very hard in the gamma ray band. So it means that you have some processes that is dominated by very high energy photons and most likely these very high energy photons are coming from the hadronic interaction processes. So it means that the source was ongoing some hadronic flaring events, and this was uh, most likely caused the sudden neutrino emission. So this change of the gamma ray spectrum is impressive because above 10 GV, you usually don't have the, the observation of this source, but suddenly in two periods when the neutrino flare was observed, you uh, have statistical significant detection, plus the spectrum is very hard which means that there were some processes that they were dominating in very high energy bands, which also caused the neutrino emission. So if we have uh, neutrinos observed, it means that we need to have a protons because if you have like two, 300 TV neutrinos, for sure you have to accelerate protons so they interact and produce these neutrinos. So there are two possibilities, is proton-proton collision or photon proton interaction, and both of them have very different properties. So proton-proton uh, collision is very well applied in, to, to model the uh, spectrum of galactic sources like supernova remnants or pulsar nebulas. So uh, the idea is that you have energetic proton that is interacting with low energy proton, is producing neutral and charged pions. So the gamma rays are produced from the decay of uh, neutral pions, while the photons, uh, while the neutrinos are produced from the decay of the charged pions, then you observe both uh, photons and neutrinos. But this interaction has a very uh, small cross section. It means that in order to have a very effective interaction, especially for blazers that you need to uh, explain very fast variation, you need to have a very dense, dense target uh, that these protons are interacting. 
uh, it cannot be inside the jet, in the jet itself, because if you have a very uh, dense target that is very heavy, you cannot move it in uh, relativistic velocities. So this means that these, these scenarios are more efficient when you have relativistic jet meets target scenarios. So basically the idea is this, you have the jet that is accelerating particles. So you have the acceleration of protons, acceleration of the electrons. Then you have some external target that is out of the jet. Then it crosses the jet. Which, which is now very dense, but it doesn't move with the relativistic velocities, but this forms a, a, a target where your protons can interact. And from this interaction, you could produce the gamma rays and neutrinos. So this is this uh, relativistic jet meets target scenarios. Uh, of course, there are different interpretation what could be this target. It can be also the accretion disk itself, or that could be the clouds from broadline region, or envelope of stars, or etc. Many different scenarios very proposed and discussed. But the most important that there are some simulations, hydrodynamical simulations that this dense target, when it's entering inside the jet, it doesn't kill the jet. So the jet is not affected, but instead it becomes an efficient target that could be used for proton-proton interaction. So in this scenario, if you try to model the observed uh, uh, photons and neutrinos from this Texas of 546, and you assume that the protons are accelerated up to 10 PV energies, which is quite reasonable, or the acceleration theories can predict this. Uh, and uh, so then you can model the observed ACD uh, within leptohadronic scenario. So meaning that in this low energy component is by the synchrotron emission of the electrons, while the high energy component is from the decay of the protons. So in that case, you can predict some neutrinos, which are close to the level that is observed by ice scoop. So this is one of the scenarios that could explain these uh, observed neutrinos. But uh, we need to remember that there is the the second uh, possibility that is when the accelerated protons are interacting with the photons. So in order to have very efficient interaction, you need to have a protons that they are, have energy more than 10 to 19 electron volts. So you need to have an ultra high energy cosmic rays. But this is not a problem because we are observing this ultra high energy cosmic rays first. And second, uh, the relativistic jets are considered uh, a possible seat where the, cos the because ultra energy cosmic rays can be accelerated. So uh, this means that the blazer jets in principle could have in blazer jets, so the protons could be accelerated in those energies. When you have these high energy protons, very high ultra high energy protons, they can interact with the photons, either with better high pi production, or if the threshold is above the delta resonance, then you can produce the neutral and charged pions, and then you form also the photons and Neutrinos. But the, the situation is not very simple as the case of the leptonic scenario, because in the leptons you have the photon field or magnetic field, you have the electrons, they are interacting and you can easily compute the expected spectrum. But in this case, so in the jet you have electrons and the protons that they are co-accelerated and these electrons are emitting by synchrotron radiation. The synchrotron photons can interact with the accelerated protons and produce neutral and charged pions. The same thing is happening when you have the jet and some external photons that they are entering inside the jet. Again, you interact and you produce these uh, uh, neutral and charged pions. But uh, if, you if you just simply compare the cross-section of P-gamma interaction and the cross-section of gamma-gamma interaction, I mean, uh, the energetic photons are interacting with the low-energy photons and they are absorbed, so they are not escaping from the region. So this cross-section is higher. It means that even if you produce these photons, they are not escaping from the region. What is happening? They are producing the electron-positron pairs. These pairs are emitting again by synchrotron emission. They are producing again photons, these photons against electrons, and so on. So you are forming a cascade. So uh, you are transferring the energy from the initial photons until it is below the threshold of gamma gamma absorption, then it escapes from the region. So you have non-linearity here. You cannot simply take the spectrum of initial particles and have easily the spectrum of the producer particles. So you have the cascade that should be followed and should be computed. So for this reason, we developed this code called Soprano, the simulator of processes in a relativistic astronomical object. So uh, this is Python based, Python and C based time dependent numerical self-consistent code. Uh, sometimes we use also C because some interaction, some process 
calculations are super heavy on the for Python, so it has a very easy interface, so it could be easily used. You could add or exclude any processes. And what is more important this is self-consistent, which means that uh, you need to properly account that uh, uh, an, an uh, energy cooling of uh, cooling of a single type of particles could be an injection term of the another type of particle. So this is transferred to the others. So you need to all these uh, transfers compute very carefully. Otherwise, you might lose some energy while your cascade is developing. So uh, in order to compute different processes, we use the energy and time uh, uh, grid. So we, we use the grid of time because the different types of particles are involved, which have very different cooling uh, and interaction times. For example, the decay of pi zero is 10 to minus 16 seconds, while the synchrotron cooling of electrons is like order of days or I don't know, week. So it means that you have a, a range of time that you need to split and discretize it. And so you make this uh, grid of energy. And in total, you would have some kind of 10 to 8 triple to quadruple integrals, which is very heavy. So if every time you compute this integral, Grass, it means that your, uh, your program will run very, very slow. So in order to overcome these things, we once computed all these cross sections, we spend a lot of time to compute these cross sections, then we are using uh, the computed cross sections every time in our computation, which means uh, the Soprano is super fast. So it, for single set of parameters, it runs uh, less than two minutes, which is very, uh, very fast, so it means that we can really change the parameters and to investigate parameter space. So here it's shown the interaction chart, so all the type of particles that are involved. And for the first, uh, photons, photons are produced from all charged particles, so from their synchrotron emission. So for the synchrotron emission of all charged particles involved in the system, they produce photons. These photons then self-interact with the protons or with neutrons and the from their interaction, they are produced at charged and neutral pions. These charged and neutral pions are either the directly produced photons or they produce muons and neutrinos, and muons again produce electrons. These electrons are again uh, producing photons and so on. So you have this very complex, uh, complicated chart of interaction. So many different particles are interacting together. And you, you need to very carefully follow each of the processes that we, do, we, we did this with uh, using this kinetic equation. So for all the type of the particles that are involved in the interaction, we use different uh, kinetic equation, taking into account all the possible interaction processes. So uh, you see that for one of the particles that uh, is losing the energy that is cooling term for the other one is the injection term and this connection should be very carefully taken into account and after all of this complicated uh, calculation what we get in the end that we get the spectrum of the particles after the dynamical time scales so after the cooling taking into account the cooling of all the particles uh, here I, uh, is shown the spectrum obtained after one dynamical time and also how the spectrum is changing in time so how it is building for example the orange line is shown the proton synchrotron with the uh, green is the uh, synchrotron emission of pions and with gray is muons so over the time you feel you are uh, uh, forming this spectrum so it means that you can follow time dependently how is changing the the emission uh, before uh, after the cascade so this code was uh, there is a, a page devoted to this code which is uh, which you could look in this address provided here in red uh, there are some more details how this code works and plus all the publication that we use this code so the first time we used this code to study the neutrinos observed from the texas of 506 plaza and uh, we investigated different scenarios to model the observed neutrinos. So in the first uh, um, assumption was that the uh, high energy component, the Fermi and MAGIC observed data are fully of hadronic origin. So it means that they're produced from the synchrotron emission of the protons. So you, with this flux in the gamma ray band, you scale your proton content then based on that you try to compute how many neutrinos you would expect to observe 
But these scenarios will appear not so efficient. So even you have a large luminosity of protons, but you still cannot to uh, explain the neutrinos observed by high school. So in the, for this reason, there is this hybrid models, which is lepto-hadronic hybrid model. So idea is that you have the electrons that are still contributing to the overall ACD from radio to gamma ray bands, but you try to constrain your proton content using the X-ray data. So basically, these protons are interacting with beta hydler process. They produce the secondary pairs, uh, which are significant around the X-ray band. So if you try to scale your flux, uh, using the X-ray data, so you don't overcome the X-ray observation, then you can compute the neutrinos. So this appears to be more efficient. Of course, it requires much larger energy on the protons, but it still can somehow explain the observed data. Arno has a wide uh, different uh, processes included, so it can be used to study different blazers. So as an example here is shown this another event observed by iSCOOP in January to 22, 2020, January 7, there was an observed event which was coinciding with an extreme blazer. What is extreme blazer? That you have the peak of the synchrotron emission is above the X-ray band. So it means this is, uh, 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 these are very, powerful sources where there is a very efficient particle acceleration that they are emitting the synchrotron that is more than the X-ray band. So using the Soprano, you could model the uh, electromagnetic spectrum observed around before and after this neutrino event, and you could try to estimate if the neutrinos could be produced from this extreme laser. But what I want to discuss more in details is about this new object that we call it the next major neutrino source candidate. So in uh, 2021, in uh, December 8th, there was a neutrino observed by iSCOOP with the energy around 170 TB. Uh, but what was more interesting after this, uh, I mean, after this observation of this neutrino, it was clear that there is a blazer that is a little bit out from the error region of the uh, ice cube observation. But later on, after this uh, astronomy GCN circular, there were three other neutrino instruments, Baikal, Baxan, and Kian Freenet, that also reported that they observed, of course, with different energy neutrinos, but coming from the same direction. So it means that this direction was very interesting because this was the first time that uh, four instruments that are operating in uh, observing neutrinos, they observe a neutrino that is coming from the same direction of, uh, and this direction contains uh, known blazer. So let's see what is happening with these blazers. So this is the light curve of this blazer in Fermi, in gamma ray, X-ray, optical UV band. So before the uh, observation of neutrino event, this blazer was very, that didn't show any peculiar structure. So it was the usual blazer showing only very minor flares in the gamma ray band and a little bit flux increase in the X-ray band. But look what is happening with this object when the neutrino was observed, which is shown with the red dashed line here. So as soon when the neutrino was observed, it coincides with the brightest flare of this object in gamma ray, X-ray, and optical band. So when the neutrino was observed, this was an exceptional state in all the bands that we are currently observing. Now, in, if we zoom more this, uh, region where uh, time when the neutrino was observed, you see with different colors, we show the different arrival uh, direction of this, uh, uh, need to, uh, diff when the different uh, instruments observed neutrinos. And you see that when uh, this, uh, uh, when the neutrinos were observed, the source was really active in the gamma ray. So it was very active in uh, X-ray optical UV band and X-ray band, it was active in, in soft X-ray band, actually, for example, you see in one kV and 4.5 kV, the light curves. You see that the changes in one kV is much uh, higher amplitude, and in fact, it was so fast that we were able to observe around 5,000 second variability in the X-ray band. So basically, the source after the Texas object is becoming the more uh, the new uh, major candidate. But what is more important compared to Texas that this has more uh, data and it 
during the neutrino observation. So this could be used for deeper uh, uh, investigation. So we did a sort of theoretical modeling of the expected, expected neutrino model. So we discussed many different scenarios, starting from considering only proton synchrotron scenario, hybrid model, and so hybrid external. So the idea is that this object is mass querying BLAC object. So you have still some lines emission, you see these things, but uh, it's totally covered by the emission of the jet. So you are not able to observe this line emission. So the most promising scenario that could predict uh, around 0.1 neutrino event is this hybrid external scenario. So when you have the uh, electrons are interacting and protons are interacting with the external photons coming from this uh, broadline region of this object, and this is because of this mass creating BLAC nature of this object. So, uh, in principle, uh, this object uh, has a lot of data, and this is only the single period that was Nathan observed, but it will be so interesting to see how this radiation is changing in time. So uh, this was my last slide. So I want to summarize here is that today uh, the experiments offer a view of physical processes in large energy range. So from radio to very energy gamma ray band, plus you have the possibility of multi-messenger observation and you have a lot of data which is accumulated from laser observation, so historical and the one that is have accumulated right in this period. So this means that this will all result in a better understanding of blazers in all scales. And this means that this field of research of AGN's blazers in the next few years will be one of the most active topic in astrophysics because you have a lot of new events observed by IceCube and more flaring blazers that are coinciding with blazers. So this will be still continue to remain some hot topic. Thanks for your attention. This was my last slide. Thank you, Narek. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this beautiful talk, Narek. Thanks. And especially for this uh, coincidence of uh, neutrino with the flaring in the uh, of the source uh, in the gem, in the term, in the X-ray is very, very impressive. Uh, but uh, uh, what I would like to mention yes. is, uh, is something new which we are uh, observing uh, in recently in uh, gamma ray burst. And uh, in some of them, in uh, the most energetic, the one we call BDHN1 and BDHN2, we notice something very peculiar, which is uh, the emission in uh, synchrotron due to the uh, magnetic field of um, a neutron star to be related with uh, a, a mechanism which we don't understand yet, uh, with the TEV radiation in this system. And I have seen that you are uh, observing as well TEV radiation. And in general, from what I have seen, you correlate uh, the, the TEV radiation, the synchrotron uh, X-ray radiation uh, to the TEV radiation as uh, originating from uh, a ultra-relativistic jet. While we are seeing evidence in gamma ray burst, that the synchrotron radiation may be related, uh, is certainly related to the new neutron star, namely to a, not to high uh, jet radiation, but to relatively low gamma. And it could be related to a new mechanism to a mission of uh, TEV radiation uh, from 
neutron star or from in your case of course you don't have a neutron star but you have the accretion uh, uh, the accretion region of the disk therefore we should keep our mind open in this direction and um, I think the cross fertilization of these two approach can be very important. Yeah, we of will return to that. Yes, of course. Thank you very much, Professor, for these comments. Yes, indeed. As I mentioned, the uh, very high energy emission is still under debate. So, in any new mechanism that could explain these things, I think would be welcome to welcome by everyone because there are many things that we still don't understand in AGNs, especially in this high energy band. So in, if uh, there isn't a mechanism that could explain all these features, I think that would be very beautiful. Because we can use the, the understanding which we are gaining, which is quite revolutionary on gamma ray burst for the active galactic nuclei, because they just scale there. Of course. Well, we will keep discussing. Thank you very much again for this beautiful presentation. Thanks, Professor. Thanks. And uh, I hope Mirzo Jan will be listening or will uh, receive this presentation. Let's contact him for today. I think he should be speaking later. You have any news from him? No, actually, I didn't receive any feedback. And I don't know if he confirmed his participation. OK, we'll check immediately. OK. Thank you. Thanks, Professor. OK, now, according to the program, we have a 15-minute break. And uh, we we'll continue in 15 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Narek, once again. Thanks. Uh, Narek, uh, may I ask a very short question? Yes, of course. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, my question is about these uh, transient blazers that, that you said. Uh, is there any special property in their optical emission com compared to, you know, normal blazers? Uh, honestly, no. In all the bands, they show uh, quite the same properties. So only the difference that they appear and they disappear. So, but uh, the X-ray characteristic is more peculiar and to, to find this kind of transient blazers, is, uh, the X-ray band is more... Uh, yes, we unique. had a beautiful presentation in our meeting from uh, 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 Narek. And we were supposed to have your presentation later on, but I don't know if you can do that. Sorry. Yes, uh, uh, I think there is a professor. We have... We have uh, Oh, okay, he switched off his mic. Yes, uh, so I, what I mean, the X-ray observation are more relevant. So in the X-ray band, you could really more find this kind of sources. So or if you have a all sky survey, is more. I mean, this time we were lucky that we were pointing in that direction. So imagine how many of these kind of objects they appear and disappear, but we don't see uh, because we don't monitor the X-ray sky continuously. Yes. Yes, and is there any observation of the ground-based telescope for this kind of transient sources? Yeah, for example, this source was observed in radio band with the radio instruments. I see. Radio instruments. So it's, uh, radio band is observed by, even in that period when it was bright in the X-ray and gamma ray bands. Okay, thank you so much for a very nice talk. Thanks. Oh. We'll be in touch. Thanks. Yes, thanks. Francesco Giannini, uh, our collaborator who passed away yesterday, July 4, uh, collaborator of the school department of Ingram. The theme of this uh, speech will uh, uh, involve the measurement of the azimut of the sun. Francesco Giannini was an expert of uh, Abruzzo traditions 
in particular, uh, we knew each other for the uh, pastoral traditions in astronomy. And uh, the measurement of the seasons and of the date of the year and uh, the use of the calendars was uh, a topic in which he was particularly uh, knowledgeable. So, we will speak about the arts in it because uh, there is a, a possibility to see along the horizon the different positions of uh, sunrise or sunset. Um, from uh, landscapes. Francesco Giannini knew all the landscapes uh, in Abruzzo where this uh, phenomenon could be observed. Uh, we uh, finished the paper on June 30 about uh, Capra Fico. There are two locations in Abruzzo, one in Guardiagrele and one near Teramo where the sun sets during the sun rises and sun sets, one rises and another one sets during the winter solstice. Capra Fico is the uh, melting of uh, Capricorn and Ophiuchus. This is the thesis of uh, Francesco Giannini that we put in this paper. Uh, so the, the azimuth in this uh, speech will be an azimuth without the landscape. An azimuth measured on the horizon, on the sea horizon. So how to be able to see differences in the sea horizons where they are not landscapes? We use webcam. This uh, procedure has been uh, proposed to the students of Liceo Galilei of Pescara to study this kind of measurement in the uh, alternance school work proposed by the government since 2015 and since the same year, the Internet Department offered this possibility to the students. This is the experience of 2022. Uh, the webcam is fixed, so in the landscape of the webcam there is a building, and this is the sketch of the building, and uh, the field of view of the webcam can be used for locating the position of the sun. Uh, for example, this position is with a couple of uh, coordinates starting from this corner of the building. The building is fixed, the web, but the web can is fixed as well. It can occur that the web can look a bit left or right because of a wind. Uh, uh, Turbulence, but uh, the position of this will be always the same with respect to the sun each day. So, with the image of the, from the webcam, we can have the X coordinate and the, in the Y coordinate, and the X, uh, the azimuth is defined, the definition, the practical definition of the azimuth is dimensionless, is X or Y. Um, very often in the um, webcam uh, observations, but also on the seaside, we can find clouds. And so, for this reason, the observation of the, of the sunrise can be thrown out. But we found a method which works also in cases of clouds. But imagine that there are clouds. And uh, so after some time, the sun comes out over the clouds. Well, the idea is to prolong backwards the, the center of the sun 
impacto de horizon. On the horizon, uh, it's always visible, even with clouds, because the clouds are never over the sea. But they are along the line of sight. And uh, this angle, we, we call it this angle theta, theta is called also parallactic angle. And uh, it is possible to know this angle by ephemeris. The ephemeris are on, um, for example, stellarium. The last version, larger than 0.20.1, has this parallactic angle. If you download the screen software for, for either uh, uh, Windows and um, Unix, this um, parallactic angle, theta, uh, can be used to recover the position of the of the sunrise over the horizon. How to do that? Let me imagine that theta is 40, 45 degrees. This is a value very similar to the real value every day, but we, we can add the precise value uh, available on the fence. So, uh, we use always the trigonometry and the pixel over, over the, the images on the internet is in Y R pixels to, to find the 45 degree uh, projection. Backwards. The tangent of the angle, we, we, we have this position of the sun, and we have the parallactic angle alpha. We know that uh, the ratio x y over x, uh, let's say y p and x p, y p over x p is equal to tangent of alpha. So the procedure is continued, uh, finding the parallactic angle over the families for that day, calculating tangent of alpha, which is like uh, uh, 0.7 uh, and so on, it depends on the angle. Uh, this is equal to the ratio d y p over dxp. This is measurable on okay, the internet, so we, we know that, we know that, and we find that. So, with respect to the vertical position of the sun at the moment, is over the clouds, we can find the position of the sun backwards when it came out from the from the uh, horizon of the sea. The uh, very show a method to find the, the summer sources because it looks uh, the, the horizon, the, the sunrise near a uh, promontorium, and we know that uh, this uh, point uh, reaches uh, uh, an external point uh, and it comes back, uh, turns at the moment of the solstice. So it is possible by knowing the time of the observation the I, the, 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 with I, the single day, one, two, three, four, five of the observation. For Pescara observation, we start the first March, and we, we are still going on, on 4, 5, July. The, the, sun, the sunrise starts in already turned in correspondence to, to the solstice day. So we have the time of the sunrise, Precise to the nearest minute, or uh, we can find the one of the feathers at the azimuth. 
if we, we have this set of data, we can see that there are some in function above the time of the sunrise, which is a maximum in correspondence of the source. So we, we have experimental points from the webcam day every day, and these experimental points can be uh, used to find uh, the maximum with the fit of a parabola. So basically, this is the, the method that we, we are following, we um, uh, used for this procedure, and uh, the recommendation which was uh, shared uh, with uh, also Francesco Bianchini, this, in Francesco Giannini, in this same poll on May, May 17, during the, the meeting in honor of Professor Sofini's 80th birthday was to put the hands on. So putting the hands on means going to the beach, looking the sunrise, taking the timing of the sunrise. But in this case, uh, we can also use the webcam in the time of the sunrise or using the uh, a record in fast motion published the day after. In this way, we can have at least one or two photos with the sun very close to the horizon, but not, not, not other data like the precise time. In the case we go to the beach, the precise time gives to us the refraction, uh, the atmosphere. If we, we take only the azimuth, we can use the timing of the sunrise from the stars. In both cases, we obtain the data arranged in this way. The second part of the experience is to learn how to treat the data, how to do a fit. Now it is possible to do it with Excel, but it is not so obvious doing a fit of parabolic data without having an experience of taking the data free. And the data analysis can be very complicated. This will be the next step of this experience of sunrise ads in Pescara uh, to be uh, conducted in the following year. Thank you for your attention. We are going now to apply the concept of the means action to apply a case the sunrise asset of 3 and 4 July. We open the images screenshots taken from the time lapse with paint. This is we can see July 3rd. At the summer, was probably rising from the horizon, but also from uh, 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 which is not very far from the horizon. In the horizon, there are uh, five times the speed, five times. So, it is a very frequent case. We have another particularity of this horizon that the horizon is going down because of the webcam optical deformation. For example, this one here, we don't see the horizon. If we consider that the horizon could be this one, we don't see the horizon as well. Anyway, now we want to know where is the, the position of the sun in the horizon from this image and the volume of the This is for the wing, 
that horizon has been left. And we want to, to know how to define the, the horizon. If we open the photo and see the one, we see a flip picture of one photo to the other. And uh, we can go back and project the dates of the horizon. Uh, this procedure is independent on the effects or in the other effects. And uh, we're going to see the sun. Okay. 
okay? And now, this moment is a is a moment when we have to measure with respect to this moment, this one, signing with a vertical this is this is a point. This is uh, 150 times 150 times 150 times So they go in this.
morning. Thank you all the participants. And uh, we meet at three o'clock uh, this afternoon with the lecture of Rosario Triquez. Thank you.